All right, greetings. Electrical Engineering 487 students. Uh, so, what an adventure we're having. Uh, we're going to continue our course now uh, in online format, as you know. Uh, I hope all of you are well, and uh, whether you're here in Bozeman or at home somewhere else, uh, uh, good luck to you this semester, and I hope all your other classes are also going well. Uh, this class, I think, will work out fine in online format. Uh, instead of meeting in the classroom where you will uh, uh, be accustomed to putting up with me talking and then having a discussion, uh, we're going to do that discussion online from now on. So I will make a video kind of like this every week for uh, the semester and just give a few introductory remarks that we can uh, get started and then I'll refer you to the D2L uh, page for the class and then that will have a prompt that you can write and participate in the discussion. Uh, what I'd like you to do with that is uh, to uh, put out your own comments down, your own reactions, and then also uh, read your classmates' comments and uh, try to give them some feedback and some things that you think are interesting as well. Now we haven't practiced in writing what we've done in class, which is we always took the time to listen to everyone's viewpoint, uh, to, to take questions, to take things seriously, and uh, we're going to continue that online, and so this will take a, probably a little bit of practice to get used to, but uh, since you're all uh, seniors in electrical and computer engineering, I know you'll do just fine with, uh, with all of that. Uh, I should be available uh, via email, uh, via any of those connections, via telephone, uh, so if there are questions that come up or things that you want to make me aware of, uh, I hope you'll definitely take advantage of that as we go along. Uh, okay, so for this uh, first week after spring break, the topic that we're looking at are some of the things that have to do with uh, computer ethics. And in particular, we're going to look at uh, a couple case studies and a couple examples that are related to things you've probably heard about in the news lately uh, that have to do with computer software and uh, the way in which uh, problems with that software or shortcomings or overconfidence enters into uh, uh, the way things work. And I, what I want you to do, again, is to keep in mind these topics. This is not something that's pointing out uh, particular villains who are software programmers or something like that. There certainly are people that are writing viruses and, uh, and uh, malicious software. But this is people who are trying to write good software, trying to write software that's helpful, and uh, like you will in your careers. And we want to just make sure that you're thinking a little bit about what can go wrong with that and uh, what obligations do you have as an engineer uh, to help foresee some of the problems that might come up and then try to do something about them. So the particular topic we are going to look at first is mentioned in the textbook, and uh, this is a uh, a uh, story, uh, a case study from um, the time in the uh, late 1980s, so it, it's old in some respects. So between June 1985 and June, January 1987, uh, there was a software-controlled radiation machine called the Therac-25. So this is not a, a diagnostic device like a, an x-ray machine, but it's using x-rays and electron beam to try to kill a tumor uh, that is in somebody's body. Just like chemotherapy, where a patient is given a drug that just about kills them, the hope is that that treatment will uh, preferentially kill the tumor cells. Similarly, these linear accelerator devices and electron devices, the uh, therapeutic assumption is that they are, are going to be more detrimental to the cancer cells than to the regular cells. That's the, uh, the, the hope, anyway, when these uh, treatments are put together. Now, the Therac-25 was a third generation uh, uh, x-ray machine for this uh, radiation therapy purpose. Um, the big difference between this model and the previous models produced by the company that made them was that uh, this model had software control. So they had uh, made a more modern version of the device that had uh, software that was running the various features of the device. Uh, unfortunately, due to what turned out to be several software programming uh, and requirements errors, they ended up uh, killing uh, uh, four people and uh, also very much injuring a couple other people in the, before this uh, device was, 
was fully understood and the problems were solved. So uh, you can read about this in the textbook and uh, then I, I invite you to go online and to look at some of the other uh, material that is available about this, uh, this particular device. I think the, the lesson of this particular story is that it shows that there was an overconfidence in the software. Uh, the engineers and uh, the people that worked on this, I think, believed that if their software compiled correctly without errors, that that was, was good. That meant that they had done a good job. What they probably didn't think thoroughly through is that the requirements and the inputs and the various things that went into that software uh, also needed to be fully considered, and they didn't do that in this case. Uh, it, in uh, many of these case studies, it turns out that software-related accidents almost always involve requirements flaws or flaws in assumptions. They aren't generally due to simple mistakes in coding or uh, implementation. So the programs generally are, are operating the way that they were written, but the programmer has not taken into account other factors and other important side effects of, of what uh, uh, could happen in, in this system. Uh, this particular device had uh, uh, inadequate self-checks and meaningful error conditions. Uh, all of us probably have been frustrated by getting a uh, computer error and it gives some long error code and you have no idea what the code needs. Um, and this device was like that. It gave the operator an error code, but there was no way to know what that meant. And so um, not having a meaningful error condition uh, was part of the, uh, the defect of this particular uh, device. Uh, one of the other aspects of this case, which I think is important for us to notice, and is something that has come up in other cases that you may be familiar with, is the lack of a response to early reports of problems. Uh, the Therac 25 uh, had several errors that occurred in the field. People reported this back to the company, and uh, the company, rather than immediately trying to understand these errors and figure out what possibly could be going wrong, the first reaction was it was an operator error. The human operator made a mistake or did something wrong. And uh, we often hear echoes of that in other cases, more modern cases. Uh, certainly we've heard about the uh, uh, unexplained acceleration of Toyota vehicles uh, several years ago. Uh, we had the General Motors ignition switch uh, problem. Uh, we've recently had issues with Boeing aircraft crashing. Uh, often the first reaction is, oh, it, the human made a mistake. The pilot was in error. This was something that uh, a, a better pilot or a better trained operator or a better driver would have been able to avoid this. And often what we find out is, in fact, that's not the case. It's a design problem, and uh, the human should not be put in the position of these systems of having that ability uh, to, in some cases, cause a problem or, or overlook an error or, or uh, be given misleading information uh, in those different cases. So uh, for our questions here, the, uh, on D2L, I'm going to be asking you what sort of things should engineers look for and worry about when making a revision to an existing system? So in this case, the Therac 25 was a revised version of an earlier successful system that had electromechanical uh, equipment, and the computer control was added to that. Uh, so from your standpoint, thinking about this, what sort of special things or what sort of checklist should the engineers have had when they were making this type of a change? Uh, they had an existing working system, they're going to change something. What would be uh, the issues that might come up in that case? And I'd like you to think about that uh, as we go. Uh, and in particular, is there a good way to avoid or think about how to avoid unintended negative side effects of making this change to an existing model? Uh, some of us may be uh, aware that the uh, 737 MAX aircraft that Boeing made that's currently uh, under investigation is a revised version of an earlier aircraft, the regular um, 737 that had been flying for many years. And in the process of doing this uh, upgrade, uh, it appears that there were some issues with the software that were developed. So the question is, is there a lesson that should have been learned from the Therac 25 case back in the 80s 
that the engineers were aware of now before they uh, went ahead with the computerized changes to the uh, 737 aircraft? That's a good question and I, it's something I'd like you to think about in your reading response. Okay, so uh, this will get us started. Uh, later in uh, the semester we will have some additional discussion uh, online and I'll also have a reading response for you similar to what we've done on previous um, uh, uh, times during the semester so that you'll get a chance to look at that as well. Okay, have fun uh, reading about the Therac 25 and I look forward to reading your uh, uh, discussion online and uh, we will keep going in our uh, investigation of, of ethics and professionalism. Thanks.